CNN, America's campaign headquarters. The taking of Elion. A photographer gets the dramatic picture. A tearful tirade from the boy's relatives. The cameras zoom in on the Miami demonstrators. Was the coverage fair or inflammatory? Welcome to Reliable Sources, where we turn a critical lens on the media. I'm Howard Kurtz, along with Bernard Kalb. Since Elian Gonzalez was rescued on Thanksgiving Day, the media have followed him every step of the way. The saga came to a head today before most of us woke up. Concerned now about when the federal agents stormed the reaction. home of Elian's Miami relatives early this morning, this is journalists were on the air almost immediately. There have been some developments in Miami on the Elian Gonzalez case. Within a few hours, an image snapped by an Associated Press photographer who had been allowed inside the home became the new heart-wrenching symbol of this story. There's pictures, and there's pictures how he left screaming and crying that he didn't want to leave. So they cannot tell me he's not crying. You can assume that this photo is going to be on the cover of every newspaper in America tomorrow morning. And the picture of a gun-toting federal agent and a frightened six-year-old boy became a major issue at Janet Reno's press conference. If you look at it carefully, it shows that the gun was pointed to the side. But the rush to report the breaking news led to some words of admonition from the anchors themselves. Do you believe that Janet Reno really had no choice but to do this? Well, what I think is not important, uh, as Ed Murrow once said, you know, when I think about a story, it doesn't matter any more than the guy at the end of the bar. The coverage also focused heavily, perhaps excessively, on emotion. For part of the morning, Elian's distraught cousin had the stage to herself. Almost lost amid the sound and fury was Elian's father, reunited with his son after five long months. Joining us now, Jim Warren, Washington Bureau Chief of the Chicago Tribune and MSNBC analyst. And in Miami, Joseph Contreras, Newsweek's Miami Bureau Chief. Uh, Jim Warren, um, in, even in this age of satellite-like technology, the story was told by two still photographs. One, the frightened Elian being seized at gunpoint, taken by the AP's Alan Diaz. The other, released by the government hours later, a smiling Elian with his father. In a, some way, didn't both sides exploit the boy by releasing these pictures? Well, they'll certainly exploit those images. On one hand, the, uh, the first photo, which we saw for hours, will be a very potent image for all the government bashers, the Castro haters out there. Already this afternoon, you're seeing lots of Republicans on the Hill saying this is an outrage. People who will immediately associate that image, regardless of whether or not that finger was on the trigger, with Waco, which, of course, is an absurdity. On the other hand, it was incumbent, obviously, for Janet Reno and the father's side to get out a much more upbeat image. And you, could, would, you just figured that was going to happen in a couple of hours, and it did. Joe Contreras, the, the coverage this morning, watching between 8 and 9 a.m. on CNN and other networks, I saw uh, extended, repeated interviews with uh, Elian's cousin, who was obviously very agitated, uh, denouncing the government, talking about what a horrible thing this was. And, of course, lost in that emotional moment, it was great TV, was the notion that the family, the Miami relatives, have basically forced this to happen because they refused to turn over uh, the boy in negotiations. Was this a, an editorial surrender on the part of television to give so much airtime to, the, to these relatives? No, I don't think so necessarily. Marislacis Gonzalez had not spoken to the media in several days. She'd been hospitalized for a fra fair stretch of last week. And I think at that point in the morning, in the proceedings that unfolded, it seemed like a fair decision to at least give her her say and have her take the cruise on an escorted tour of the house and relate her version of events. Also, bear in mind, Howard, that at that point, the plane bearing Elian to his father in Washington had not actually landed uh, at Andrews Air Force Base. I think it only touched down at 9.20. So between 8 and 9 a.m., I thought that was fair game to air and run on the airwaves. Okay, we're also joined now by CNN's Susan Candiotti. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on the, uh, the chaos of the coverage this morning? Well, certainly it was a very difficult situation. You know, we were all trying to guess as anyone would who has been covering this story for so long, to try to estimate when the government might do something, uh, when it would happen. So in the middle of the night, frankly, not many of us thought that that would occur, perhaps early in the morning. So when it did happen, 
It did take a number of people by surprise, but as you saw, those cameras were there to record the moment, and now we will see that played time and time again. A more difficult question when it comes to uh, Mari Slesis Gonzalez, and it, it, it's true, she hadn't spoken to the media in a couple of weeks, and, and frankly, she has been very emotional on every occasion when she has talked to the press, and so it's important to get her version of what happened uh, on the air. I just wanted to pick up a point with Joe, if I might. I want to draw a contrast between a still photograph and a regular motion picture video type of photographs and the power of a still over video. For example, I'm thinking of Vietnam, where you had the famous picture of General Luan holding a gun to one of Viet Cong's heads, uh, the little girl running down the street, napalm. Those pictures had context. This picture of the arrest of Eliam has no context. It's a powerful picture, but what it leaves out, even though it may win all the Pulitzer Prizes, what it leaves out are the efforts by the government to try to solve this in a peaceful way. And so the picture is essentially going to offer a distortion of the history of this engagement. You agree with that, Joe? Well, I think I would agree with that, but that's the very nature of a snapshot. Uh, by its very nature, it only captures a specific moment in time. And hopefully, when those Pulitzer Prizes are awarded, and when this entire saga is recounted, that will be put into the extended caption, if you will, under that very, very powerful photo. That indeed, to a large extent, this was brought about by the intransigence of the boys' Miami relatives and their refusal to comply with a federal government order. Therefore, therefore, that picture doesn't have the context that both you and I are now talking about, powerful as it is. Well, that's true. But as I say, that then becomes the responsibility of media to maybe put an extended caption below the photo. There's no way that you can get around... Uh, can I interrupt you, Joe? Just one last question on this series. Do you expect the media to add that sort of context to itemize or to explain the consistent months of efforts to solve this peacefully, rather than serve up, which they all will, first thing in the morning, as we're seeing it now, the picture itself? Well, I would certainly hope so. I can't speak for other media, but... I imagine that our cover story in next week's issue of Newsweek will have quite a bit of retrospective taking readers through the past 150 days and putting it all in perspective. And I think, Bernie, one problem is I think you're slightly underestimating the intelligence of the American public, which has now had to endure <laughs> this coverage for a long time. They are putting that photo into a certain context, and I think a lot of them, as opposed to the very passionate folks who've been surrounding poor Susan Candiotti all these weeks outside as she sort of, I think, must have squatter's rights by now inside that house. Uh, unlike those folks, I think most Americans realize that this came at seemingly at the end of a very long and frustrating period for the U.S. government. So I don't think that image necessarily will have the long-term potency as, for instance, the one that you mentioned uh, from the Vietnam War. Jim, I'm wondering uh, what you think about the, uh, the effect of the sheer mass of media, as you just observed, have been in Miami day after day, what effect that might have on the, on the situation. I want to take a quick look at a, uh, a piece of tape from early this morning on CNN when some of the demonstrators got a little out of hand. Let's move away from that videotape. We're losing. Thank you. We well, don't need to be hearing text words in the middle finger, you know. Yeah. Jim, obviously, uh, to certain, to the cameras. Well, obviously, to a certain extent, we are part of the problem. Be curious to know how big those crowds would have been the last two weeks if everybody would have pulled their cameras out. No doubt that some of those people uh, whose motives are to be questioned uh, probably would not have been there were it not for those cameras. But it's difficult. It was a sexy story, TV, and it's sort of thrust to uh, find the latest soap opera with this very appealing, attractive kid uh, decide to fix on that uh, story, park themselves in front of the house, and the crowds came. Howie, if they were denouncing television at that point, they're attacking the single medium that has brought that story to America and the world. Hard to argue with that, but of course there's also a lot of motion against the government. Susan Candiotti, uh, you were there on the ground. The effect of the journalists, the cameras, the, 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 the media presence on those demonstrators, on the Cuban-American community there. Well, uh, they've been very, become very used to the cameras, that's for sure. And you have the usual things that occur every time uh, people tend to get ready to do a live report. That's when the protesters uh, sometimes start to reinvigorate themselves and perform for the camera. Because most of the time, it can be very, very quiet here. Now, today it was important for the cameras to be here to record that moment. And if I may just add, we're already getting two versions of what happened regarding that photograph and which way the gun was pointing. You, uh, I talked to Al Diaz uh, not long ago who took 
those very powerful photographs and I asked him which way was the gun pointed because the family members are saying that the gun was pointed directly at the boy's head. Al Diaz, who took the photograph, said, I couldn't tell, Susan, when I was looking through the lens and snapping the photograph. So there's someone you thought might be able to give you an eyewitness account uh, and quite can't give us that detail. So all sides are trying to use this information and certainly how, how important and how rare it is to have the cameras this close to that happening, to the seizure. And so now we can... This is CNN Breaking News. I'm Darren Kagan in Atlanta. We've broken into reliable sources to bring you these live pictures from just outside of Andrews Air Force Base. This caravan of cars you see arriving contains Senator Bob Smith, Republican from New Hampshire, and another one of the cars, another one of the vans, are the uncles of Elian Gonzalez, Delphine and Lazaro Gonzalez. Now, they have shown up at the Air Force Base. Um, this is where Elian Gonzalez was reunited earlier today with his father through his attorney, Greg Craig. Juan Miguel Gonzalez made it clear that he was not looking to have a visit from his uncles today or from any cousins with Elian Gonzalez. And so they went to Capitol Hill. They met up with Bob Smith, at the senator, and now they've come to Andrews Air Force Base together. As we understand it, the senator has permission to come onto the base. However, the family members do not. Where it goes from here, we will have to wait and see. Let's bring in our Patty Davis. Patty, it's been a long day no doubt. Um, have you had any word about what officials have done to get ready for this moment as the family members arrive looking for a visit with Elion? Uh, you have to repeat that question again. I didn't quite hear. Any word on what? What officials have done to get ready for this moment for the family members to show up at Andrews Air Force Base looking to meet once again with Elion Gonzalez? Well, the public information officer here at Andrews Air Force Base just told me that this family, the, the, the relatives, the Miami relatives, do not have any authorized access here uh, to this Air Force Base. So basically, uh, the officials here at Andrews Air Force Base uh, say that they're not going to let them on, uh, on the base right now. Now, as you said, Senator Bob Smith, however, could conceivably himself have some access to this base and potentially uh, try to meet with Elian and his father. But Elian's father, Juan Miguel Gonzalez, has said uh, through his attorney, uh, uh, Greg Craig, today that uh, he does not want to meet with those relatives. Uh, no indication yet whether or not uh, he might meet with Senator. Um, Senator Bob Smith, in a press conference earlier this afternoon, said that uh, he indeed um, had talked to Greg Craig, and, and, and Craig had said that, uh, that uh, the father does not, at this time at least, wish to meet with those relatives. Patty, yeah. right now we're showing pictures across the street from that visitor's booth, uh, from that entrance to the base, and we're seeing uh, protesters and some members of the media. Describe the scene for us from someone who's standing there. Uh, I am down the road, about uh, a little, little ways, about uh, half a mile at the, the next gate, the gate we think where Elian Gonzalez's father went in this morning when he arrived at the uh, Air Force Base. So I'm seeing exactly what you're seeing uh, right now that CNN is putting on the air. So the, you're seeing it right along with us. There, uh, I'm seeing it right, the entourage lining up there. That is the visitor's gate. That is the gate the visitors go in. We go in that when we uh, are at, at, at Andrews Air Force Base attempting to cover the president taking off in Air Force One or the vice president on one of his uh, presidential uh, trips that uh, he is um, traveling all over the country for now trying to uh, uh, win the nomination. They're apparently meeting now, uh, looks like, with, uh, with the guards there at the gate trying to smooth their way in, see if there's somehow some way that they can gain access. Darren? It, it appears that they would be at an impasse at this time. They're, while you were talking, we could see the guards leaning over into that first van. We think that's the van that's carrying Senator Smith with the uncles in the van perhaps behind him. Um, maybe they're waiting for an answer from somebody higher up to decide what exactly to do about the situation right now. Patty, tell us a little bit more about Andrews Air Force Base. You were alluding to the fact that this is where Air Force One and Air Force Two uh, live and are cared for um, when they're not flying the president and the vice president around. It's not a coincidence that this is the area that was picked for the reunion with Elian Gonzalez and his father. Absolutely not a coincidence. This is a very secure Air Force Base, as you said. Air Force One is housed here. Air Force Two is housed here. Official government travel goes in and out of this Air Force Base. You are not allowed on this Air Force Base unless you uh, have, uh, have permission to get on it. And uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, you have to uh, 
You have to present identification, and they have to make sure that you have permission to get on this base. As far as these relatives are concerned, according to the, uh, the spokesman here at Andrews Air Force Base, that is something they do not have at this time. But, you know, that's something that could change. There's, the situation's been very fluid. It could change. Uh, perhaps there's some way uh, Juan Miguel Gonzalez will change his mind. We just don't know. We'll have to see uh, how this unravels. But a very heavily patrolled Air Force Base here right outside of Washington in Maryland that houses uh, uh, government planes and is very secure because the president often takes off here and arrives here in his airplane as well as the vice president, Darren. All right, Patty Davis at Andrews Air Force Base. Thank you, Patty. We will continue to keep our eyes on the situation at that visitor's gate at Andrews Air Force Base as Senator Bob Smith and the two great uncles of Elian Gonzalez try to gain access to the base. Right now, we'll go ahead and rejoin reliable sources in progress. called La Voz, which is uh, Nanoska uh, Perez, and you get a lot of information. Uh, I, I call it wishful thinking. If you are a Cuban hardliner and you live for the death of Fidel Castro, they will give you the information to support that. Okay. Look, Forgive me, Emmett. I want to bring Joe Contreras back to the discussion. Joe, we're all in the instant analysis business on a story like this. Newsweek obviously crashing its story, uh, its cover story, I'm sure, for next week's issue. But I was watching uh, CNN this morning, for example, uh, speculation about, well, what if the father took the son and tried to go back to Cuba without telling anybody? Child psychologist being interviewed. Uh, does the speculation get uh, sometimes out of hand in your view? Well, sometimes it can, and we've seen that happen time and time again on this story. Uh, I think that it's important to point out the facts that there has been a commitment by the U.S. government to keep the boy and his father in the United States. The U.S. Justice Department has the power to do so with, through a departure control order. So I think you always have to keep the speculation in check. One thing I just want to add um, about the Spanish language media, it's important to point out that the Latin American Spanish language media has painted these Miami relatives as a bunch of kooks. So, uh, it's absolutely unfairly in your view. US unfairly in your view, Joe. Excuse me. Un has the American media portrait of the family been distorted in your view? Uh, no, I don't think so. If anything, I think the coverage of the Miami relatives has, in some ways, been a little on the soft side. We didn't find out until early February that Lázaro González had a drunk driving problem. We didn't find out until early April that the man had not held a steady job in five or six years and had exaggerated or distorted his employment history mm -hmm. when he applied for a job as a bus mechanic in the Miami-Dade County public school system. So no, in some ways, I think the Miami relatives got off fairly easily in the early going. Jim, you know, listen, I mean, go listening to Ann, it's uh, good to know that uh, the English language, National Enquirer, and Weekly World News and other tabloids <laughs> seem pillars of responsibility <laughs> compared to what's going on there in Miami. But also, speaking of the English language press, there's no greater uh, burden on anybody in the last month or so than it's been on some of the Florida newspapers, Miami Herald in particular, this is the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, which the Tribune owns. That's and cool. what I've seen of both, uh, mostly uh, online, has been that they've done a fairly good job under very, very difficult circumstances. I'd like to say that I, there's a new editor at the Miami Herald, and we're hoping that we're going to see improvement. That's Marty Barron, who used to be at the New York Times. But it, it was not the Miami Herald that told us that Lazaro Gonzalez had four drunk driving convictions. His brother, Delphine, four drunk driving, not one, two. Numerous uh, arrests for drunk driving. His license suspended for three years in the 1990s alone. That came from the New York Times, Peter Kilburn. It was the Sun Sentinel who told us the job history of Lacero, that he was basically an unemployed uh, car mechanic. Why did the Miami Herald not give us that information? Why did we need it from the New York Times and the Sun Sentinel? Well, I just want to make the observation. Also... This is CNN Breaking News. And we interrupt reliable sources once again to take you back to Andrews Air Force Base. Just moments ago, we saw the van caravan carrying Senator Bob Smith and two of Elian Gonzalez's great uncles trying to gain access to Andrews Air Force Base. They went up to the visitor's gate. There was a bit of a stall. And just seconds ago, if we have those pictures, the caravan turned around. This is the corner of the intersection, and so the people are running off to see the van go. Um, as we understood it, perhaps Senator Smith had access onto the base. The two uncles did not. Elian Gonzalez's family did not have permission to come onto the base. Juan Miguel 
Elian's father had made it clear earlier in the day that he was not interested in having a visitation with the families. That's a that's the situation at Andrews Air Force Base. The great uncles turned away. Now we want to take you to Miami, to the Little Havana section, to the home where Ellen Gonzalez has been staying, had been staying for the last five months. Police, Miami police, getting ready to make a sweep there, uh, have their riot gear ready to go. Don't know exactly the situation that happened there, that things got out of hand, that they decided it was time to clear people out of there. But it has been a heated situation all day long in Little Havana and on the streets of Miami. Is Susan Candiotti standing by? Can we bring her in? Do we have Susan? We don't have Susan Candiotti. Okay, we will keep our eye on what's happening in this little Havana section in front of the home where Elian Gonzalez stayed the last five months, also at Andrews Air Force Base where the six-year-old has been reunited with his father. Okay, I guess we have Senator Bob Smith ready to go. The senator was, one, was the man who tried to get the, grandfather, the uncles onto Andrews Air Force Base. Here's what he had to say on the mood of Elian Gonzalez's Miami relatives. They say they're distraught. They're, they're beside themselves with grief. I can't tell you what a, a, a horrendous meeting it was up there to, to, uh, to be in that room and to see the agony of, uh, on the faces of these people and in their hearts. It's horrible. I mean, it's, I've never never seen anything like it. never thought I'd see this in America. Senator Bob Smith of New Hampshire made those comments before driving to Andrews Air Force Base with the two great uncles. And as we just saw a couple moments ago here on CNN, those great uncles and Senator Smith turned away from Andrews Air Force Base. So we will take a break. More news ahead on CNN. Amazing as it may seem, the same bare aspirin you take for muscle pain and back aches can actually help stop someone you love from dying if taken during a heart attack. Peter? Peter? That's why aspirin is the one pain reliever you should never be without. Talk to your doctor now. I said you'll be okay. There. Take it for pain. Take it for life. I love to call my old teammates, and I can call them anytime I want, thanks to MCI Fastens every day. So, Bucks, how's the team? Well, Michael, it's a rebuilding year. With MCI Fastens every day, calls only five cents a minute, every evening, and all weekend long. Hey, Bucks, any bright spots? Uh, there is this Australian kid. Got moves just like you. Stay in touch with old friends and new. Just call 1-800-EVERY-DAY to join Dreyfus presents a continued tradition of tax smart investment solutions to defend what's yours. The power of you, your advisor, and Dreyfus. Now that iMac has brought the internet into millions of homes, the question is, do you change your decor to match your iMac? Or do you change your iMac to match your decor? That's the conundrum. Welcome back to Reliable Sources. Uh, Joe Contreras, uh, Frank Rich, this morning's New York Times, writes that uh, Elian Gonzalez has become the media's new John Benet Ramsey. He says that Elian has been sacrificed to the media gods who extract a fresh, a fresh slice of video meat daily. He calls the whole thing a ratings winner. Fair point? It is a fair point, and I think there have been some dramatic lapses in judgment on the part of the news media over the last five months. Notably, the decision by ABC News to air that Diane Sawyer interview not once, but over three consecutive mornings without ever once getting the express oral or written permission of his only biological parent. And of course, the airing of that almost obscene video uh, that one of the boy's Miami relatives 
did of him at 1 or 12.30 in the morning. Seemed like a POW tape. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And yet we've seen that endlessly, just as we will see uh, today's photographs, I'm sure, for many days to and come. And how, if I might add, and Joe, the claim of several network TV executives this week that their real interest in the story had to do with the underlying foreign policy dispute over uh, Cuba Castro is uh, absolute hogwash. But if I might have uh, corrected or added one thing to the Frank Rich column, which was very good on the exploitation of children, um, there are a lot of fingers to be pointed around here. And if you've been living in Washington the last four or five years, no group of folks have exploited children more for their different purposes than the folks on Capitol Hill and Bill Clinton. Whether it's pushing their notions of what to do in Bosnia, whether it's pushing their version of the best uh, budget proposal, or whether it's pushing their version of handgun c control. If I had a buck for every press conference I've been to where we brought on a little kid who probably had scant notion of what the uh, details of the issues before. So it's uh, not just the media. Be Bernie? Uh, before we wrap this up today, let's take a poll among ourselves about the pictures that will be used on the newspapers that we're watching all day today, Saturday, on television. Are we going to see both pictures, that is to say, the seizure, the transfer of custody, so to speak, picture, uh, and the picture of the father and son? Will we see both pictures, Jim, or one? If there is one photo, this is going to be an absolute fascinating, uh, difficult choice to make. If there's one, I go with the reunion photo. And? I think the reunion photograph. The only one, you think, huh? And I think there'll be more reunion photos. What about down in Miami? Then? Joe? Susan, Joe? Sadly, I think that the photo that most editors will choose will be the photo of the boy being clutched in the arms of that female INS agent dashing out of the house towards the van. Uh, I think uh, most newspapers will probably have both pictures, but I would bet a fair amount of money that the larger picture will be the more dramatic and gunpoint Joe's photo. answer is, and my answer is why I will never be a uh, cable television news executive. <laughs> <laughs> And you have some thoughts about the uh, portrayal overall of the Cuban-American community? Yes, I think that it's a, it really troubles me how the media always talks about Cuban exiles in Miami as if it's a monolith. Um, and also that Cubans on the island all think alike. There is a lot of diversity there, and one of the problems And a lot is, of diversity in terms of opinion on this story? Yes. Well, no, it's true that the majority of Cuban yeah. exiles in Miami support keeping him in Miami. But there is a considerable amount, and there's a silent faction there, that are silent because there is a fear of speaking. When I interview people for my stories, they all have to be on re off record. Literally, they tell me they will lose their jobs, mm. there will be death threats, there is repression there, and there is no support from the American media to address them, to give them voice. We will have to hold it there. And the same thing is the opposite true is, is also true in Cuba. We will have to hold it there. Anne Louise Bardak, Joe Contreras, excuse me, Joe Contreras in Miami, Jim Warren, Bernard Kalb. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be right back. <laughs>